Hello guys, welcome back to our Instagram Live. Today we'll be talking to Carla, one of our breast augmentation patients. And so we'll be talking about breast augmentations, breast augmentation recovery, and perspective at the whole process from a patient's point of view. Hi. All right, Carla, so How welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Let me introduce you. So Carla is one of our patients. She is a previous breast augmentation patient, and she's also into fitness, so she'd be a great person to ask questions about breast augmentation, and fitness, and recovery. Now, Carla, tell us a little bit about yourself. I forget, how long ago was your surgery? A year ago. A what? year ago, a couple weeks ago. Oh, really? It's only been, I, I thought it was more like two years or so. All right. And No, no. Uh, give us a little bit of details about your surgery. So what type of implants you had? Where was the incision? How, how, how was the surgery done? Um, incision under the breast fold, mm -hmm. um, implants are silicone Okay. and, um, the surgery was awesome. Your whole team made it phenomenal. Awesome. Now you've been posting a lot of pictures about fitness and you're so into fitness. So, um, we'll be talking about breast limitations, but uh, I'd love to sort of state this a little bit more in the fitness and recovery, um, by somebody who is in the fitness because one of the most common questions we have after breast surgery or any surgery is when can I go back to the gym? So let's try to answer those questions. But before we get to recovery, let's go all the way to the beginning. Tell us a little bit about your process. What made you decide that you want to have breast augmentation? What made me decide to have a boob job? Um, I, very small chested, God didn't give me any boobs whatsoever. Okay. I was all nipple and chest and I was so... Um, I didn't like it at all. I know that some girls love that. They're totally fine and confident with that, but I wasn't. Okay. So I decided to change it. Um, I think I finally had the money. I was finally in the right headspace to do it. I mean, it's surgery. Okay. Um, I've never had surgery. That was my first surgery. So it's a big deal. What was the process that you went through to, to find somebody? Like, where did you look? How did you look? What, what made you choose a top three? What were the features you were looking for? Instagram for sure. There's girls that I follow that have had their boobs done by you okay. and you're just very popular. I mean, you come up right away and your whole team is phenomenal. I've been to many consultations and their teams, the environment, it just wasn't my vibe. And you really have to like the vibe, the situation, the people. Like people say, you know, you, you got to get along with your surgeon and your team. Um, tell me how many, how many consultations did you actually end up going to? I believe I met with four surgeons in total. I think, first of all, your team is amazing. I Thank mean, you. Kim and Megan, they're always on the ball, emails back and forth, text messages, whatever, whenever. I think that's what really got me as well. Uh, tell me about the, the day of the consultation. Do you remember it? How, how did it go? What, what happened? Um, I believe I met with Kim and Megan. Okay. And they took pictures. I put the little bra on and I played around with all the sizes and it was so much fun. Like I was eager. I was in the implant sizes. I was trying them on, dancing around. I was having so much fun. And before you came for a consultation, did you follow us on social media? Like, did you watch our stories? Yes, absolutely. Cause I wanted to make sure, like see what I was getting into, seeing people's reviews. I actually uh, got Snapchat back just to watch your stories. So I'm, I'm curious, tell me, uh, did you find our stories helpful in sort of educating you? Absolutely helpful. I mean, you really show a lot of the clinic and a lot of the team and it kind of makes you more comfortable going in because it's like, oh, I know these guys already, kind of. Some clinics have these 3D, 3D modeling where they take pictures of you, create a 3D model and they simulate uh, augmentations. I, I'm not a big fan of that. I like to use actual implants. So what we do is we have actual implants and sizing bras that patients put on. You put the implant in, you put a shirt and you kind of get a feel of what that looks like. It was a lot of fun. Um, I remember Kim put the implants in my chest and she lined up the circle of the back to the nipple and she said that's where they'll sit mm -hmm. once um, everything falls into place. And it was a lot of fun to put a shirt on and to see a girly silhouette. So I, I like that better than the 3D model. It, it looks really cool, but really it's a computer simulator guessing what you're gonna look like with these implants. It's an actual implant kind of presence now. It's not right. perfect because when it goes underneath the muscle, underneath your breast tissue, it gets compressed. So it, it changed things a little bit, but I think in my opinion, it gives you better estimates. How close would you say was the sizing before surgery to your final account? Was it a good, good estimator of what you will end up with? Absolutely, absolutely. I think 
a lot of girls that already have breasts, like let's say they have a C cup and yeah. they get implants, maybe they won't see the implant as much because they already have some tissue to cover that implant up. But I was all skin and bone and chest. I was double A for sure. And, and I didn't get any bras without any padding. So what, what cup size are you right now? I wear a D bra. A D bra. And what size implant do you have? Yeah. Um, 425. So 425 took you from nothing to a D cup. Now what's your yeah. height? 5'7". Okay. So that's, you know, people always ask, so 5'7", no breast, 425 gives you a, a D cup. Now I understand everybody's a little bit different. So people go out there online, they find pictures of somebody, they say, oh, I like this girl. She has five these implants. That's what I want to get. It doesn't work like that. When, when people go and find wish pictures, please find wish pictures, bring them in. But I really want to find a wish picture of someone who's going to get your body type. Ideally, you don't just find some model, but you actually go to the plastic surgery website, you find before and after pictures. And what you want to find is somebody who looks like you in the before picture. And then, you know, regardless of what implant nature, you can kind of see what was done with a particular implant. Ultimately, when you choose a wish pick, bring it to us or bring it to your surgeon and let the surgeon decide how they take you from where you are to where you want to be instead of trying to tell us, oh, I want this implant because that particular implant on your body may give you a completely different result. So for example, in your case, Carla, you had nothing. You had 425s that took you to a D-cup. On somebody else, a 425cc implant, that exact same implant may only make you a C-cup or, or, or a D-cup or, or make you a double D. So again, don't be so focused on particular numbers when you when you do your research more about the look um, and then bring that to your surgeon I, mean, I chose implants that were smaller mm -hmm. that would make me a c cup that would make me a b cup and i tried those on in the bra and mm -hmm. i put the t-shirt on and i saw what that looked like and it was still too too small from because i'm small already i didn't want that so i decided for 425. So when choosing implants, uh, what we do is we measure our patients, we measure the breast width, and based on breast width, we try, try to choose an implant that kind of fits you. If you choose something that's too small, then you have a certain width breast with a little lump in the middle, and it doesn't look good. If you choose something too mm -hmm. big, it's possible, but the bigger you go, the less realistic it's going to look. The more side whoop you're going to get, the more you will see rippling, um, and it just looks disproportionate. So we try to, you know, we make recommendations, but ultimately it's really up to the patient, and unless they're asking for something totally ridiculous, uh, I'm okay to do it as long as they understand what's going on. Now, with going with big, you know, a lot of people want big, but you need to understand big also means heavy. It also means big in all directions, right? So implants are round, and as they want more projection, they're also going to get wider and higher. Uh, there was a patient who messaged me recently. Uh, she sent me a picture of somebody online that had these implants that were like up to her you know, clavicle and asking me, like, what happened there? Like, I said, well, she has a small frame. And she chose a big implant, not, not one of our patients, by the way, but just a picture. But again, this patient chose an implant that was really big. She wanted to go really, really big, but being very petite, meaning the implant was sitting where her breast fold was, it was big in all directions, including height, and went up to her clavicle, and they just looked really, really unnatural. Um, this yeah, patient right. posted these pictures, so clearly she was happy with the look. She liked it, which is another point to make is that, you know, eyes in the eye of the beholder, things mm -hmm. that you may like, other people may not. I am not the gatekeeper to beauty. Uh, I'm more, you know, a person who makes sure that this is safe. And as long as it's safe and it's what you want, then we're able to do this for you. Of course, I do give people guidance and explain what is normal, what is not, and what impact it will have on you. We probably measured you. Kim probably does the measurements. Mm -hmm. She measured you and, and chose a few implants, a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger. You get to choose yeah. what you want, and you also get to choose the profile. So we choose the width, and then you choose, you know, do you want a little flatter implant, like a motor profile, or a higher? Which one did you get? High profile. Yeah, yep. just because I was so flat, I needed some more projection. I mean, when I sat those implants down on your white couch yep. and I knelt down and like looked at the projection, I was like, there's no way I can do a moderate. Most, some people can. Most, most people choose high profile. I would say 80 to 90% of our patients end up choosing high profile. I understand though high profile does give you a rounder look. Now you can have a very natural looking breast with a high profile, but generally a moderate profile implant will give you a more natural look. And even though most people walk into the office saying, I want to look natural, they do end up choosing the more unnatural, higher profile. And that's perfectly fine. Gotcha. People want the upper profileness. Typical breast augmentation consultation takes about an hour. And the reason why this takes so long is because people keep going back and forth, back and forth with sizing. A lot of people spend a lot of time 
going back and forth on the day of consultation. And we do have people come back a few times for repeat sizing. Now I'm very, very uh, strict with this. We want people to make a decision before surgery, um, not the day of like, um, I, I get very frustrated when I walk into the pre-op room to do markings. Um, um, when I walk into the pre-op room, ready to go into surgery and the patient is still unsure, says, doctor, what do you think is a good size, is a bad size? Minutes before surgery is not the time to be choosing an implant. So typically if people are unsure about that, then we say, you know what, let's cancel surgery, go home, think about it again, because making a decision on the spot is the wrong time to make a decision. Yeah, yeah, no, understandable. So when you came when you came back for your one last check, did you change? Did you end up changing your size, or did you just confirm that you you were okay with what? No, you I actually just confirmed. Like I I don't know. It's just something in your mind, I guess, that just mm -hmm. makes you kind of doubt. I I, I don't know because it's yeah. surgery and it's gonna be implanted in you and and yeah. then that's it kind of thing. All right, so let's talk about the day of surgery. So describe what happened on the day of surgery. I think my surgery was booked around seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night. So okay. I went to work that morning just to get my mind off of surgery. I was so scared. Um, had my medication and everything prepped. Your team was so awesome to send the meds to my clinic and I got all that. Um, and then left work, hopped in the car, didn't eat for 12 hours. So I fasted that whole morning okay. um, and afternoon. And, and then your team provides a stay to the hotel, which is awesome. So I booked into the hotel and it really gets your mind off of surgery. You get to watch TV, you get to hang out, do your thing. And then your team gives you a call and says, hey, come down, it's time to go. Very first surgery. Right. So most people are terrified of going under. Were you scared of going under? I was scared of going under. Yeah, absolutely. What was it that you were scared of? I don't know exactly because in surgery, your job isn't to worry. That's not your job. It's the surgeon's job to do all the worrying and all the hard work. And mm -hmm. it's your job to do the recovery after to wake up and do your part after. But um, there's just something about going under and being on all those heavy drugs and being asleep. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure. So how was the process? Do you remember? I got dressed into the gown and somebody walked me into your operating room and it was the brightest room I've ever seen. So many lights, it was awesome. And then they put me down on the bed really quickly. I don't think they give you much time to think about what's going on, which is awesome. Your team is really great. Um, they laid me down. They strap your arms to the sides just to make sure I guess you don't move during surgery. Yep. And they put the needle in my arm, in my hand, sorry. How painful was that? And, pardon? How painful was that? Not painful at all. It was a little pinch. I think I was more focused on the surgery and going under. I didn't care about a little needle in, the, in my hand. <laughs> um, and I remember looking at your anesthesiologist and saying, I'm scared. I don't want to go under. I'm scared. And he said, you're ready. And so am I. And I just remember like drifting away and it was the best sleep I ever had. How long were you asleep for? Felt like a second. I mean, I woke up and there was only a few people in the room and I heard beeping and I was so cozy and warm. You put this warm blanket on me. And I remember I asked for my phone right away and I took a Snapchat and Instagram mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, I was alert. Um, your nurse asked me if I needed help into the wheelchair and I did that on my own. I was totally fine. So for you, the patient, it's a little pinch in the arm. The IV goes in. The IV is actually the medication knocks you out. And then once you're asleep, uh, the gas is what keeps you asleep. But you go to sleep through the IV medication. You're completely out. Then uh, our anesthesia uses what's called the laryngeal mask. So it's a mask that's not sitting on your mouth, but inside your mouth. So it doesn't go down your throat like you, know, you see on TV. It's not inside your throat, it's just inside your mouth. And this is what delivers the gas that keeps you asleep. As soon as the surgery is over, they turn the gas off. You exhale all that anesthetic gas and you start waking up. But your memory doesn't work really well and you don't remember the first few minutes. So to you, it's just like falling asleep and waking up. We were talking about your first day about fasting. This is an important point that people sometimes don't understand. Before surgery, it is crucial that if you're gonna be going under, that you fast, you cannot have any food or liquid in your stomach. Because when you're mm -hmm. under, you're completely out, you don't have any reflexes, you don't have a gag reflex. 
And if for some reason you're regurgitating anything from your stomach, you can go down the wrong way, go down the airway, and you can get what's called chemical pneumonitis, pneumonia, you can suffocate. Um, it can be a really bad thing. So it's really, really important that you have nothing in your stomach. Absolutely and nothing. I didn't so, know why. So, you know, wow. a lot of people don't understand it. Sometimes they think, oh, it's just, they're being overly cautious. I can, I can cheat or, or they even forget. I had one patient who uh, showed up to surgery and she's sitting in a pre-op my nurse goes in to check on her and there's a big water bottle. And I'm like, what's going on in here? Uh, and you, which part of no food or drink did you not understand? And she's like, oh, I'm- Surgery I, canceled. I, I thought no drink meant no alcohol. Like, no, no drink meant no liquids. <laughs> and the funniest part about this story is that this patient, it was her second surgery with me. So this is the second time she came in. So I have no idea what happened she first time. She knows better. But, yeah, she should know better. Like the first time did we miss something that she like had a jug of water before she came in to see us? I don't know, right. but I'll, I'll never forget this. You know, no drink means no alcohol. Like, all right, no liquids. Anyways, okay, back That's back funny. to recovery. Yes, no liquids. Back to recovery. Food. How was your pain after surgery? That's probably the next big question. I didn't feel any pain at first, not for the first maybe 45 minutes, maybe mm -hmm. hour. Okay. And then it started getting uncomfortable, but I slept through it. It was okay. So during surgery, we give people freezing. So we freeze the whole area. So when you wake up, often the whole area is numb. And that's why people don't feel any pain. And then as the medication wears off, you start feeling more and more pain and pressure. The bigger the implant you go with, the more painful it is, the more pressure you have. So people that go with like huge implants, like when we go over 600 cc's, those, those patients, when they wake up, they feel a lot of pressure. They feel like there's an elephant standing on their chest. But something like 4, 425, more of a routine implant, uh, probably a less pressure. Uh, once the pain came on, how intense was it? And what did you do about it? The pain, um, it was pretty intense because I went from nothing to 425. I, it's not huge, but the stretching, mm -hmm. the stretching of the skin is yes. what really hurt. For a few months, the mm -hmm. boobs were really glossy looking from yeah. stretching and um i didn't get any stretch marks thank god but um the stretching really hurt for sure and i didn't have pressure so much but i felt like two things were glued to my chest um stretch marks is a concern people often ask about stretch marks is something you get not from stretching of the skin it's genetic and hormonal People are predisposed to stretch marks and they'll get them even if they don't have implants. You, you can see people that maybe gained weight or grew really quickly in their teenage years and they'll have stretch marks on themselves even though they've never, never, they were never obese or they, they never had large breasts and they, they will have stretch marks. Uh, I find that people that don't have stretch marks will not get stretch marks after breast implants. People that get stretch marks, um, unless they're genetic, tend to be hormonal. Uh, so people that are either on birth control pills or take birth control pills or develop a pregnancy after the surgery, I find sometimes can get stretch marks. And this is again, mm. estrogen related more than the implant itself and the size of the implant. So we've made it through surgery, made it through recovery. Now comes the part where this becomes almost like your specialty. This is why I wanna to talk to you. You're so fit, you're so fitness oriented. Talk to us about your recovery and path back to gym exercise and what you did, how you did it? Oh man, um, it was tender for the first few months. I, I, I forget what you said. Is it like two months or six weeks you shouldn't go to the gym? Six weeks, just like my name, Dr. Six. Six weeks, you gotta take it easy. Exactly, so I mean, I, I'm very much into handstands, like being upside down, being yes. on my arms. Yes. And so I, I know myself, I would have did a handstand if I went into the gym at six weeks. So I, I told myself no. So I just didn't go. I mean, I let myself heal. You have to let yourself heal first. I mean, and listen to your body. After I went into the gym, yeah. I, I was still feeling tender. Like I tried a push up and I was like, Ooh, that doesn't feel too, too good. So like, I won't do that right now. You know, it's, it's really important like, for everybody to yourself. understand that recovery is an important part of the process. Once you've had a surgery, when you leave the OR, it's not over. Uh, sometimes people get misled um, by all these fancy gimmicky terms out there. Uh, flash recovery, instant recovery, 24-hour breast augmentation, same-day breast, whatever. 
all of these things, what they mean is that you feel good, mm -hmm. but you're not healed. Just because you feel perfectly fine after your surgery the next day, it doesn't mean you can go back to normal life. Your body is still going right. through all the stages of wound healing. You have to let it heal. You have to follow the post-op instructions because there's no surgery out there that is completely foolproof. There's nothing I can do to keep your breasts intact if you go out there and start exercising and doing things you shouldn't be while they're healing place. Yeah. Six weeks exactly. is the magical mark. Six weeks is the time yeah. it takes for scar tissue to form to be strong enough to withstand day-to-day -day exercises. Um, yes, exactly. And it, yeah. that's what was in my head the whole time. I was like thinking like, if I do a push-up, will I ruin the scar tissue that's formed already? So you just have to be careful. So we ask our patients for six weeks not to exercise and then slowly get back. Um, if you had a breast augmentation, I tell my patients not to do push up, not to do bench presses, not to work on your pec specifically for three months. If you had a tummy tuck, I tell them don't do sit up scrunches, don't go for a core specifically for three months, even though you can go back to the gym after six weeks. So when do you start working your upper body? I think three months after. I had my surgery March, July. Okay. Yeah, July, and I went, I started easy. I mean, like I said, I I just tried stuff to see what felt right and what felt okay. So when was it, how many months after surgery were you back to completely normal, regular exercises? Um, maybe seven months. Seven months, okay. Yeah, question right. we had from a follower was about animation deformity. So animation deformity is when implants are placed under the muscle. So you have an implant and a so implant and muscles on top, every time the muscle contracts, if you flex your pecs, the implant gets pushed and, and it moves. Do you have animation of how yes, good or bad I, is it and what do you do about move, it? I mean, there's nothing to really do. I mean, there's exercises I do at the gym and I have a sports bra on and mm -hmm. my boobs are moving. It's yeah. just something that happens. <laughs> uh, that's the price you pay for being under the muscle. Now, some people try to combat um, animation deformity by releasing the muscle a lot. Um, I don't like to do that. I like to keep the muscle a little bit more intact so the muscle acts like a little sling holding implants in place so they don't drop too much. If you release the muscle to minimize animation deformity, then there's nothing holding the implant underneath. It's almost like a dual plane and then implants over time drop and drop and drop and then you have to have a revision to lift them up. Um, and then over time they sort of pop and end up even being over the muscle. So I'm not a big fan of what's called a dual dual plane technique um, so going under the muscle you know one of the prices you pay is the animation deformity um, but the benefit is that the implants being held up high you have a low risk of dropping bottoming out uh, low risk of capsule contracture we do go over the muscle um, over the muscle is great it does have a slightly higher risk of capsule contracture and there's nothing holding implants in place so over time they're more likely to drop and need to be lifted up and repositioned the next question we got from one of our followers was, how long was your drop and fluff? How long did it take them to settle? I would say maybe seven months. Um, not long. I've been dropped now okay. for a good while. And they're fluffy and they move. Okay. I mean, people always have this conception that breast implants are hard and they stay still. I mean, my boobs jiggle. And that's normal. Now, people that have stiff, hard boobs, that's called capsular contracture. And that can happen. It's one of the potential complications of breast augmentation. It's not a normal thing. I had a patient who came to see me, I think eight years after a surgery with bilateral capsule contracture. And I noticed that the other side was really, really hard. And she said, oh, I had no idea it was not normal. I thought this was normal, that this is the way it's supposed to be. No, your, your, your breasts should be feeling very natural. If they're not, go and speak to your surgeon just to make sure everything's okay, that you don't have a capsule contracture. So I've actually used one of your pictures before. People often ask, what can we do to keep the implants from falling down? So I say, do what Carla does. Upside down, handstand, guaranteed to fix your droopy boob. Well, exactly, because like you say, people always think that implants will fix gravity and will fix all this stuff. It doesn't, and go braless and stuff. Like, I still wear a bra pretty often. Exactly. Like, I don't want them to just keep going. It, it, it's a myth that if you have implants, you don't need a bra. If you think about it, yeah, skin you know, still stretches. Not only that, sure, but we've just added weight to your breast. Implants are not anti-gravity yeah. devices. We've added weight to your breast. They're gonna fall a bit more than your natural breast because now there's more weight pulling them down. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So get upside down. Get upside down. Handstands. Okay, we have a patient there, a patient of mine who had 
um, 620cc implants and she says she has a decap. So like I said earlier, um, 620 in this version is a decap. I guess in you, a 420 is a decap. Um, implants, same implant or different person will give you slightly different result. Everybody's a little bit different. All right. Um, question about breast implant illness. Um, someone is scared about them. So breast implant illnesses is this social media entity that people talk about. You have these women that have all kinds of weird medical issues that we don't really know where they're coming from and they're relating it to the implants. The only thing that, um, you know, kind of gets my attention is that there are some women that say that when they take their implants out, their symptoms go away, they feel better. So it's, it's a little bit of correlation. But that's still, even though it seems like it is, that still doesn't necessarily mean it's the implant itself. Um, was it a contamination? Was it something about the surgery? You know, like it seems to be related to implants, but is it really the implant itself that's causing these problems? We don't really know. Um, unless we have proper scientific evidence, studies need to be done. Until then, it's difficult to say that, yes, implants are causing this. Is it the material in the implant? Is it the pressure of a big implant? Is it the way the surgeon did the surgery? Was there some sort of contamination? Is it completely unrelated to the implant? It's difficult to say. And to say that just because they took the implant out and symptoms went away, it's clearly the implant, that that's to me is false logic. It's like saying, you know, someone can say, you know, the sun rotates around the earth. It's obvious. Like you, you go out there, you see the evidence clearly. The sun goes out up there, goes across, comes out the other side. The evidence is undeniable, you know. But now we know science, we know astronomy, and we know that actually, no, Earth is the one that's rotating and going around the sun, even though it may not look like it. The same thing could be with the implants. There's something going on, but we don't really know what it is. So again, difficult to say what's going on. You have but, this YouTube video that I thought was really smart. It was talking about implants mm -hmm. and how other people have different implants. Like people have a fake hip. Exactly. People have shot exactly. and the bullet is still inside exactly. of them and they live you don't you um, don't hear about hip implant you know, there's that. a lot of foreign objects that go into a body and it's okay yeah so so there's a lot of arguments out there that are really bogus like you should not have foreign body in you like yes you can people have hip replacements knee replacements cardiac implants they have dental implants uh they have joints you know finger joints uh, people have silicone in their like in their fingers so sometimes when people cut their fingers they lose a tendon it's replaced by what's called a hunter rod. That's the name of the object. It's actually a silicon rod. Let me go on to more questions. Thoughts on low profile implants versus fat transfer to breast. Uh, tough one, fat transfer to breast gives How you- How is fat transfer? Yeah, do it's, you have to have a lot of fat on your it's tummy? It's not about How having a lot work? of fat. It's about the fact that the amount of fat that you can inject and to make it survive is very small. So fat transfer to breast, is ideal for somebody who absolutely doesn't want to have implants and is very, very happy with very, very small change. I want to wrap it up. Uh, Carla, I want to thank you for joining us. I'd like to ask you one last question. Um, you've thought about this, you know, IG Life coming up. Is there anything else you've thought of that you wanted to share with us that we haven't covered in our talk today? Um. No, just listen to your surgeon. I've seen a lot of horror pictures, a lot of crazy things. I mean, don't wear push-up bras a week after surgery and don't do not do a push-up a month after surgery and, you know, yeah. fast. And, and, and trust your surgeon. You chose your surgeon. You trusted your surgeon to cut you open. Trust him or her to care for you afterwards. If you don't, then you chose the wrong surgeon to cut you open. I, I oft, so often see patients have surgery and then they contact us asking for questions or go on social media, ask other people questions. Like you're, you're asking the wrong person. You should be talking to your surgeon, your, your, your clinic. They are the people that know exactly what happened to you. They are best suited to answer your questions. If you don't trust them to answer your questions honestly, truthfully, then you chose the wrong team to, to cut you open. All right. Yeah. And your team is so on the ball. It's great. Thank you. So thank you again very much. Thanks a lot for joining us, sharing your story with us. And again, guys, if I haven't answered your question, please DM us, message us in the comments, and I will get back and answer all the questions that come our way, okay? Yeah, me too, for sure. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good one.